For those of you who might be unfamiliar, Chick Tracks are these little comic books designed to propagandize to Christians. They've been around for decades. They're ultra-conservative, ultra-religious, fear-mongering comics that don't really set out to convert atheists into believers. The goal is really to radicalize existing Christians. You've probably seen them lying around at one time or another. The guy who started the whole thing was named Jack Chick. He was born on April 13th, 1924, released the first Chick Tract early in the 1970s, and eventually died on October October 23rd, 2016. His publishing company, Chick Publications, has been designated an active hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center for their anti-Muslim, anti-Catholic, and anti-LGBT positions, among others. Church groups love to buy these things in bulk and leave them all over the place. Bus stops, grocery store benches, restaurant tables, anywhere they think somebody will be bored enough to pick it up and read it. So imagine my surprise when I find that there are anti-Jehovah's Witness Chick tracts. I already covered one of them, and if you're interested in a deeper history into Jack Chick, his motivations, and his life leading up to the creation of his publishing company, give it a watch. Link is in the description for that. But my plan for this video is to go through the other Jehovah's Witness Chick tract. The two videos stand independent of each other, so if you don't feel like going back to watch the other, don't sweat it. Okay, with that being said, let's get into it. The name of this Chick Tract is War Games. Before we look at the Chick Tract itself though, let me tell you why Jehovah's Witness Chick Tracts are so significant to me. I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. I was in it for 18 years. I was baptized in everything. I dedicated my life to Jehovah before realizing that it was all manipulative nonsense. Thing is, when you leave the religion, they set out to turn your life into a disaster, intentionally. They ban your friends and family from ever speaking to you again until the day you die. If they break the rules and talk to you anyways, they could be cut out of their friends and family's lives too. It's called disfellowshipping. Then your ruined life, intentionally ruined by them of course, serves as an example to the rest of the congregation for what happens when you choose to go your own way. It's a deeply immoral system designed to prevent people from leaving at all costs. They aren't legally allowed to jail you. They aren't legally allowed to prevent you from doing anything you want. So instead of controlling your body, they do everything they can to control your mind. So with that background under our belt, let's take an objective look at the anti-Jehovah's Witness propaganda cartoon, War Games. Here's the first page. You are the target. After your death, your soul will live on for eternity, in heaven or hell. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell, and they don't really believe they're going to heaven either. Not most of them. They think only 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses will be going to heaven, known as the Anointed. They think the Great Tribulation will come, where the world bans religion and hunts Jehovah's Witnesses down. When I think how far we are now into the... How's it out there? It's not good. It won't be long, maybe an hour. Is, is Kevin with you? He said he's not coming. That he doesn't want to have anything to do with us anymore. How sad. Now, this far into the Great Tribulation, After the Great Tribulation, Armageddon comes, which is God's war against Satan and mankind. The 144,000 anointed people will be raptured to heaven somewhere in here. It's hard to tell what they believe from week to week because they change it constantly, but from what I can tell, they think the Great Tribulation will start, which is when religion will be banned and the four horsemen will ride through town, causing plagues and wars all over the place. Then there will be a short period of respite, then God raptures the 144,000 anointed people, including the governing body members, that run the organization right now. After that, the tribulation continues on until Armageddon starts. After Armageddon, which is basically where fire will rain from the sky and take out anybody God doesn't like, there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous, people who didn't have a chance to learn the truth, as they ironically call it. But anybody who dies in Armageddon, or any apostates like myself, will be destroyed forever. So here's the bottom line. Regarding page one, Jehovah's Witnesses obviously deviate heavily from standard evangelical 
evangelical beliefs about heaven and hell, and it seems like the Chick Tract is trying to establish that. Here's panel two. Peace-loving people have been brainwashed and turned into soldiers, not for a country, but for a belief. This one is named Melissa Gordon. Well, yeah, I can agree with that, I suppose, to some degree. But I have to say, this feels a little like a pot calling the kettle black situation. Page two. Here's Melissa with little Emily ready for combat. Melissa's military headquarters is located in Brooklyn, New York, where they program families for world conquest. Well, it's kind of weird they're framing it this way, but yeah, I guess Jehovah's Witnesses do kind of view themselves that way. Though they are passionate. Pacifists. They don't believe in violence under almost any circumstances, only in self-defense, and maybe not even then. And actually, their headquarters aren't in Brooklyn, New York anymore. The organization was nearly sued out of existence by people who accused them of mishandling child abuse accusations. The court agreed and awarded the plaintiffs a whole heck of a heap of money. Tens of millions. So Jehovah's Witnesses came up with what I think they called the master plan to bring in lots of money fast. The plan basically entailed having the individual Kingdom Halls deed the property and building to the organization, and then combining the congregations together and selling off the extra buildings they weren't using anymore. The plan even involved a strategy that airlines use to make sure they maximize space, called overbooking. They know, say, 5% of the 100 members of a congregation won't come to every single meeting, so they assign 110 people to each congregation, so every chair is filled every single meeting. That frees up extra properties to be sold off to pay for the lawsuit settlements. In some cases, they even bought new property and materials and had a congregation build a brand new kingdom hall and move into it. Then they sold off the old building. Since they aren't paying for labor, they netted tens of thousands from each piece of property. And that is exactly what they did with their headquarters in Brooklyn. They moved to Warwick and sold their Brooklyn property for a crazy high amount. Some speculate it was around 1.3 billion, but we have no way to know for sure. Anyways, I got off on a tangent there. Let's keep reading. Page 3. This is the ammunition facility. The most powerful weapon in the arsenal is the Watchtower magazine. Melissa is taught to love it, defend it, and trust it more than the Bible. She has attended five meetings a week and gone through intensive training, making her combat ready to battle for your soul. Okay, that's a weird way to frame it. Technically, Jehovah's Witnesses are specifically told that the Bible is the basis for everything and it should be trusted before all else. That being said, the Watchtower is the governing body's flawed interpretation of the Bible and they trust that interpretation before anything or anybody else. So, mostly right. As for panel two, the organization has changed the way they do things over the years, but at the time this chick tract came out, they were doing five meetings a week. They were just piled on top of each other. Other. They had the Sunday meeting, two hours long, which is actually two separate back-to-back one-hour meetings. The days and times varied from congregation to congregation, but the next meeting for me was the book study on Monday nights. That was an hour. Then there was the Wednesday night meeting, which is an hour and 45 minutes long. So you'd go to meetings three days per week, but two were split into two different parts. So again, technically correct, but not really correct in spirit. Page 4. A man says, What do you see across the street, Bonnie? Bonnie responds, Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't want you to open the door, Frank. Frank says, I didn't run when I was in military combat and I won't run now. Wow, what a hard... Why are they making it out to be a military type of situation? This is bizarre. Now, I get it. Most people don't want to deal with them. I don't like dealing with them either. Don't be rude to them. Just tell them you're not interested and you want them to put you on the do not call list. They're supposed to put you down on a map and come visit once every 10 years or so to see if you still live there instead of once every year or so as they usually do. Page five. The Jehovah's Witness says, Hello, I'm Melissa, and this is my daughter Emily. The householder, which is what we used to call them, householders, says, Nice to meet you and Emily. I've got questions I'd like to ask you. Did you bring your literature with you? The Jehovah's Witness says, Oh, yes. Probably surprised somebody's finally interested in what they have to say. The householder says, Let's sit under the tree, and my wife, Bonnie, will bring us some lemonade. The kid says, Thank you, sir. This really isn't the usual reaction. 99% of the people you meet say they aren't interested and shut the door in your face. Some are understanding understandably indignant that you just woke their ass up on a Saturday. Might be their only chance to sleep in all week. Another half a percent are receptive to the message and want to learn more. That's how they grow their numbers. And the other half a percent are people like this fella. They set out to debate the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is actually honorable in my opinion. Just don't expect to get anywhere with them. They've been programmed to lock down their critical thinking skills when they're challenged. 
Page six. The householder says, Now, Melissa, do I understand you think Bonnie and I are pagans and you want to save us from annihilation at the Battle of Armageddon? Melissa responds, With all my heart. He says, Good, so tell me, which one of these can I trust to protect my soul from destruction? He holds up the watchtower and a Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses don't view worldly people as pagans. They think they partake in pagan practices, and they think they're part of Christendom, or the world as they call it. They're worldly. If he asked a Jehovah's Witness this question in real life, they'd give the answer I explained earlier. They believe the Bible first and foremost, but the Watchtower conveys the governing body's piss-poor interpretation of what the Bible says. Page 7. The householder says, If I'm a soldier and I can choose from two weapons, I want the one that'll save my life and those around me. Which one would you choose, Melissa? Melissa responds, I trust Jehovah's Watchtower. It gives me new life. It's interesting they slipped in the term new life. That's the term Jehovah's Witnesses use to describe what's happening when the governing body members admit they were wrong when God gave them prophecy previously. So God reveals to them that Armageddon is going to take place in 1975, for example. And when that prophecy fails, they say they receive new new light from Jehovah that shows that the end wasn't actually supposed to come in 1975. That's a real example, by the way. That really happened. They even had a phrase, stay alive to 75. Those who are alive when January 1st, 1975 rolls around might live forever. Well now, as Jehovah's Witnesses, as runners, even though some of us have become a little weary, it almost seems as though Jehovah has provided meat in due season because he's held up before all of us a new goal, a new year, something to reach out for, and it just seems it's given all of us so much more energy and power in this final burst of speed for the finish line. And that's the year 1975. As one brother put it, stay alive to 75. Anyways, that's what new light means. I found it interesting that Jack Chick slipped the phrase into the Chick tract. The householder responds, Does it claim to be inspired by God like my Bible? She responds, No. The footnote says, The Watchtower admitted on August 15th, 1950, page 263. However, the Watchtower does not claim to be inspired in its utterances, nor is it dogmatic. Uh, okay, the Watchtower has only ever had 32 pages maximum, so I find it kind of strange they're quoting page 263 here, but either way, it is true. It doesn't claim to be a new Bible, but the governing body does believe they receive prophecy from God, and they tell people what that prophecy is through the Watchtower. So I guess it's kind of inspired by God, in a roundabout way. The footnote says, Awake Magazine, March 22nd, 1993, page 4, admitted the brothers preparing these publications are not in fact their writings are not inspired, as are those of Paul and other Bible writers. The householder says, So you'll trust your eternal destiny to a magazine that admits it is not inspired, instead of God's holy scriptures. Melissa gulps. He says, The Bible says the holy scriptures are able to make the wise unto salvation. The footnote says, A crack appears in Melissa's armor. The whole not inspired by God thing might have been the case then, but the governing body members do believe themselves to be modern prophets who receive direction from Jehovah. And they're the ones that approve the articles written in the Watchtower, and I suspect they probably write the occasional important paragraph or announcements themselves. Either way, Jehovah's Witnesses believe the message the Watchtower is trying to convey to them is from the prophets of God, the same way the writings of Moses were supposed to be inspired by God. They believe they have to come to the governing body members for information about God because they're God's mouthpieces on earth, so take that for what you will. Like I said, it might have been different when this was written, but that's how they view it now. Before we continue, I want to mention something. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of cool shirts and mugs and stuff on there. You can also sign up for Audible by using my affiliate link, which is in the description, telltaleatheist.com slash audible. Signing up helps my channel out a lot. And finally, you can check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel. I go through long-form breakdowns on there, like the Jehovah's Witnesses TV show, and the Kenthoven Seminar series. So give it a look. You might find something interesting. All links are in the description, of course. Okay, let's take a look at page 9. There is a precious person inside that armor that Jesus died for. Is she worth helping? Absolutely. The Watchtower completely controls her life. What can crack her armor off? 
This is the Achilles heel. When faith in the watchtower is shattered, everything comes apart. Then what must take its place? That's an interesting perspective. Respectable that they feel these people are savable. You'd be deeply disturbed if you saw what Jack Chick had to say about the LGBT community. He does not consider them savable. Like I said, his take on LGBT issues earned his company the honorable title of hate group. Rightfully so. Deeply disturbing stuff. Page 10. Uh-oh. Looks like they're gonna talk about the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses think Jesus died on a stake rather than a cross. There's a picture of Jesus on a pole sticking out of the ground. The householder says, Melissa, is this the way the Watchtower says that Jesus died? Melissa responds, yes, on a torture stake. The householder says, where did Pilate place the sign over Jesus? She says, over his head. The householder says, please read Matthew 27, 37. Melissa responds, it says, and set up over his head accusations written. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. A Cat says meow. The householder says, if the sign was over his head, where were Jesus' hands? Not over his head. The footnote says, another crack appears. Honestly, I'm really not sold on this argument. The sign could have been over his hands, which were over his head, and that's probably exactly what a Jehovah's Witness would say to you if you presented that argument to them. That being said, if we're assuming Jesus was actually a real person, which I'm not completely convinced of yet, but assuming he was, and assuming the Bible was accurate about how he died, I think it was probably by crucifixion. It was pretty standard in the area in Bible times. But like I said, I'm not completely convinced Jesus was even real. I'm willing to believe he was, I just haven't been convinced by the evidence yet. And it's kind of a low stakes position, no pun intended, since I don't really believe in his divinity anyways. I grew up believing he died on a stake, not a cross, since I grew up Jehovah's Witness. When I left, I re-evaluated everything. I came to the conclusion that Jehovah's Witnesses were correct about some things, incorrect about others. For example, they were correct about the fact that the Trinity isn't actually in the Bible, which comes up later in this chick tract. Turns out monks came around centuries later and changed some Bible verses to make it seem like it supported the Trinity. It doesn't. But the cross versus the stake thing, they appear to be dead wrong about it. Again, pun unintentional. They're just coming to me. They're also wrong about God's name being Jehovah. It was Yahweh, not Jehovah. Anyways, let's keep reading the chick tract because it offers an interesting argument in favor of Jesus having died on the cross in a second. Page 11. The householder says, one more question, how many nails are in Jesus' hands? She says, one. He responds, could you read what Thomas said in John 20, 25 to me? She says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and stick my finger into the print of the nails. The householder says, so is it one nail or more, Melissa? She responds, gulp. It's more than one. He says, then the watchtower is wrong. Jesus didn't die on a stake. If the watchtower couldn't get that right, dot, dot, dot. That's a really interesting argument. I went to the interlinear version of the Bible, which shows the actual words that were used in the original language. And it looks like the word used was he long. I know I'm mispronouncing it, but give me a break. I don't speak the language. Underneath the word, it has indicators to tell us more about how the word was used. It says N-GMP. If you click on the indicators, it shows N means the word is a noun, G means it's genitive, which indicates possession or close association, M means masculine. Some languages use masculine and feminine language for inanimate objects. I don't know why they do that for a nail, but it's just how Spanish works. I'm assuming it's the same with Greek. And P means plural. It was, in fact, nails. Plural, as in more than one. So interestingly enough, he seems to be correct here. The book refers to more than one nail. That doesn't necessarily mean it was a cross. They could have nailed his feet in too, or put multiple nails in his hands. There are all kinds of explanations that would include a stake and multiple nails, but it does seem more likely to me that it was a cross. Like I said, it was the common method back then anyway, so I have no reason to doubt it was a cross. The reason Jehovah's Witnesses believe it was a stake rather than a cross is because the word that's used in the Bible is storos, which translates to a stake or a pole in the ground. When you translate it, that's what pops up. So without further investigation, it looks like Jehovah's Witnesses are right about this, but you have to dig into the historical record to find out if that was the most common method at the time or not. And it wasn't. The cross was. So it's reasonable to assume that it was a cross when it was the most common method, and the word used refers to a pole in the ground. Jehovah's Witnesses just want to be unique little snowflakes or something. Anyways, let's take a look at the next
next page. Page 12. The householder says, How can you trust it to lead you to eternal life? We can trust the scriptures. May I read to you from my Bible what it says about Jesus? She says, Yes! Some rando walking by says, What's wrong, kitty? A dog is growling at it. And then the cat says, Roar, and runs after the dog, who says, I, I. Why include that? I feel like I have to read it because it might be leading up to something. It's just weird. Anyways, the householder says, What if the scriptures proved that Jehovah and Jesus were one and the same? Melissa says, That's impossible and then thinks to herself, but what if it's true? It's not. As I said earlier, the Bible has some loose support for the Trinity because the wording was changed by monks hundreds of years later to give the impression of support for it. One of the few things Jehovah's Witnesses get correct. Page 13. The householder says, Jehovah spoke through the prophet Isaiah. I am God and there is none else. So only Jehovah is God, right? She says, absolutely. He says, then Jehovah says, I've sworn by myself that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. So every knee will bow to only one being. Who is that? She says, why Jehovah, of course. The verse doesn't say that every knee will bow to only one being. It says every knee will bow to Jehovah. There's no exclusivity to it. Based on the context I have from the Chick Tract alone, the verse doesn't imply that people can't bow to other people too. And aside from that, the verse was written centuries before Jesus bebopped along. It's Old Testament. Page 14. It says, Now look at Philippians 2, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. If we only bow to God alone, then Jesus must be Jehovah. Both are the same God. Yeah, except the Isaiah verse he quoted didn't say people can't bow to Jesus too. It just says people will bow to God. The Trinity is a nonsensical doctrine. Think about it. If people hadn't drilled it into your head when you were a little kid, you wouldn't give it a passing thought. I have no idea how people came up with such a ridiculous doctrine. Why would God send himself to earth to sacrifice himself to himself to appease himself? The evidence in favor of the Trinity is weak at best. It's simply not in the Bible. Page 15. We must only pray to Jehovah, right? But when Stephen was being stoned to death in Acts 7, he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Which did he pray to? It shows a picture of Stephen saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The comic continues, At death our spirit returns to God. Jesus received his prayer and his spirit because Jesus is God. Well, to play devil's advocate here, he could have been praying to God through Jesus. Because, you know, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Seems like he's trying to retroactively write support for the Trinity into the Bible where it wasn't previously. And he's not doing a very good job either. The next panel says, Melissa, after Jesus died and rose again, he appeared to doubting Thomas, and Thomas called him my Lord and my God. If Jesus is not God, that's blasphemy. But Jesus accepted his worship because Jesus is God. Yeah, Jesus isn't God. It's a nonsensical doctrine that doesn't belong in the Bible in the first place. That's just what it is. This is post hoc justification for a ridiculous idea. Page 16. Isaiah the prophet spoke these words of Jehovah. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Okay, I'm not sure what that has to do with anything. Jesus didn't say that. The book of Isaiah says that. And Isaiah was written 750 years before Jesus even appeared. We're talking Old Testament right now. Why'd they even include that panel? The next one says, The apostle Peter testified of Jesus to the high priest, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Melissa, Jesus is God. No, Jesus is not God. I haven't read the verse they just quoted in Acts, but from what I see here, it reads like what Jesus said earlier, which is that nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to salvation because it was his sacrifice that blah blah blah. I'm not seeing how this page moves anybody closer to believing in the Trinity. Page 17. It says, Melissa, Matthew 1 fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 7:16. Mary, a virgin, bore a child. That child, Jesus, was called Emmanuel, which means God. God with us. Jesus lived a perfect life. People tried to find fault in him because he did things God was supposed to do. In the panel, Jesus says, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. The character responds, Why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Page 18. 
Many good works have I shewed from my father, for which of those works do ye stone me? For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makes thyself God. This is all very flimsy. The people of the time were Jewish. Jesus was a Jew. When Christianity appeared, it completely changed to a brand new theology, with brand new beliefs and expectations and culture and everything. Jesus was supposedly capable of all kinds of unusual stuff. Doesn't mean he's God. This is panel 2 on page 18. Evil men beat Jesus, then killed him in the Roman way, by crucifixion. Note, two nails. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Huh, that's weird. That verse calls Jesus God's Son. Not God, but his Son. How about that? Is he God's Son, or is he God himself? The answer is, he was supposed to be God's son, according to the original language. The Trinity is nonsense from a historical perspective. I honestly have no dog in this fight. I don't care one way or another. I'm an atheist. I'm just saying it isn't biblical. At the bottom of the panel it says, but three days later, page 19. Jesus raised his own body from the grave, just as he promised. Only God could raise his own body. Melissa sniffs. Her armor is shattered. Page 20. Melissa, I care about you and your daughter. Please take this Bible and check everything for yourself. May God lead you into all truth. She responds, sniff, thank you. The kid says, bye, kitty. At home, Melissa says, Jesus, I know you are Jehovah God. I believe you died for me. Please forgive me and come into my heart. Not taking the low-hanging fruit. Not gonna do it. The bottom of the panel says, and he did. That's sound advice, what he said earlier. Take this Bible and check everything for yourself. Jehovah's Witnesses have their own translation of the Bible, and they've altered words to fit their already existing beliefs. I've seen a couple of examples of it in the book of Revelation, for example. Their Bible is a piss-poor translation, and on top of that, we don't even know who translated it. They don't publish their sources or translators. If you're gonna pick a new Bible, I'd recommend the NRSV. It's the version that renowned Bible scholar Bart Ehrman uses. He knows what he's talking about, and I trust his judgment on this stuff. Whatever you do, don't use King James. It's garbage. If for no other reason than because it's written in Middle English, it's nearly impossible to understand. At least use a Bible version that uses modern English. Page 21. Melissa is saved. Jesus said, him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Uh, I have no idea what that means. Another fault of the King James Bible. I should be able to read it and understand what's being communicated. Do people think God spoke with a Middle English accent? It's nonsense. There's no reason why you can't use a more up-to-date version that uses language that's easier to understand. The stuff was written in Greek. The New Testament was, anyway. It's like people are trying to punish themselves for not speaking Greek by reading a version of the Bible that's impossible to understand. They have another panel at the end here that says, Dear Reader, the Inspired scriptures state that Jesus Christ, who died for your sins, is Jehovah God. No, Jesus isn't God. Jehovah isn't God's name, and I'm not even sure the dude was real, let alone died for my sins. But that's neither here nor there. Then they have a cringy little section where you can check a box to indicate that you believe it, and that you trust him and his shed blood to save your soul? Why is this so cringy? Really, they didn't have to bring up shed blood. Why? Why do it? Like all those comparisons I'm constantly hearing from Christians about bathing in lamb's blood and stuff. What is that all about? It's like a blood cult or something. The final checkbox says, will you receive the Lord Jesus as your savior, and it has a date you can fill in. It's pure, unadulterated propaganda. Trying to get people worked up into a panic attack to agree to believe in God and go to church. And remember, it's directed toward kids. Kinda messed up. Anyways, that's the end of the Chick Tract. Overall, they had some interesting points and some bad points. I appreciated what they did with the cross versus the stake, but like I said, don't let this comic fool you. The creator, and the comic more generally, is deeply disturbing propaganda that used Cold War era communism propaganda as a model, according to a letter written to a reporter in the 1990s, directly from Chick publications themselves. If you're curious about that, check out the other Chick tract I covered recently. Link is in the description. Don't forget, if you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me by checking out my Patreon or my Telltale Unfiltered channel. I go through long-form breakdowns of things like Kent Hovind's seminar series on evolution or Jehovah's Witnesses' monthly TV show, so give it a look. You might find it interesting. All links are in the description, as always. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.